Thanks for staying with us. Now, in recent times, on one hand, fraud and the I must make it at all costs has taken center stage where young people are getting arrested with links to fraudulent crimes. However, on the other hand, we are increasingly seeing millennial entrepreneurs setting up businesses that are balancing, I mean, that balances financial returns with sustainability goals. Now, Mark Winterflood, the global head of collaboration at HSBC Private Banking, was quoted to have said, our research shows that millennials are more driven to influence the world around them and exert a positive social influence than their parent generation. Now, millennials are made for impact. However, there is a cloudy storm hovering around that generation with the current pressure and a lot of economic uncertainty. More young people are desperate very vulnerable and if not properly guided they might also fall on the wrong side now patrick okundu has held several positions with leading canadian companies like the royal bank of canada and now bmo financial group he spent eight years working for financial institutions like zenith bank stambic ibtc and the asset management corporation of nigeria that's amcon he has been an entrepreneur since age six and he continues to run businesses and partnerships besides his full-time job. Pascal has mentored over 200 young people who have become successful entrepreneurs, academics, or are holding good jobs with great organizations across the world. He is an engineering graduate from Unilag and holds an MBA from the University of British Columbia. Now, remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Waze Show Africa <coughs> One with the hashtag Waze, or you send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081 8038 Thank you so much for joining us, Pascal. Thanks, Ua. Thanks for having me around. I'm the only one in the world that can't see you guys now. <laughs> yeah. Every other person can see us. <laughs> but okay. it's fine. We can see you and you're looking dapper. So we're good. Thank you. Great lighting. I'll add that to my resume. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pascal, when I saw your resume and I saw that you started work, I mean, started um, business at age six, I said, Biko, what happened? So maybe you should give us a bit of a background, you know, as to your personal journey. And maybe we can now start off from there. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone from Nigeria. Good evening, everyone in Nigeria, all the way from um, Vancouver, Canada. Here, I'm so glad to be here. Um, so, to answer your question, Oa, I I chose the part of I did not choose the part of entrepreneurship at age six. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a young person growing up in Africa, I was in Cameroon at the time when I was six. You know, but the uh, disadvantaged economic conditions of the time and, you know, the, the, the type of background that we had at that time, you know, forced me to explore ways to, uh, you know, make money, support my mom and dad to pay bills, and most importantly, fund my education from very early stage uh, with the support of my mom. So um, just like every young person in Africa and uh, Nigeria who, you know, have so many odds that you are dealing dealing with at the time, uh, especially now. Um, I had my own share of experience, but you know that exposure at that age actually introduced me to the multiple challenges that an average African faces, you know, which makes us realize that um, as a young man in Africa, we have so many things that you know, are at odds you know, with us. You are, you are working so hard, you are extremely determined to live a good life, but you, know, you have some very robust systemic challenges that actually, you know, are working against you and your progress. So that was how I got introduced to entrepreneurship at age six. I was selling all the, everything you can imagine on the streets of Cameroon, um, hawking in traffic, selling plantain chips and everything wow. you can imagine um, just to make ends meet. And I survived it. Wow. Thank God. Wow. Gross child abuse. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but I'm wondering, uh, Pascal, because you see, that is a story of a lot of people, right? Yeah. They were faced with certain challenges, and the only thing they could think of was to do things that are legit. So where did we, you know, lose our morals when it comes to making money or making ends meet as millennials? Because now we've, I mean, if you go on social media, it's either they're har arresting a hush puppy or there's a young girl recently that is trending on um, 
on uh, she was trending some days ago and they they call her a picker or something they found nine millionaire in her account i mean this is someone that's in her 20s so nobody is thinking of trying to work hard you know to struggle through life and whatever to make money everybody just wants the quick way microwave money and is on you know is there on the table so where did we lose all of those things so i i don't think we we lost it i think um you know, growing up as a young person in Africa, uh, you don't get to choose your early behaviors and habits. You imitate. So um, I would like to say that growing up in our own generation as millennials, we probably did not find sufficient um, role models. We probably did not see um, sufficient examples that we can embrace as, you know, good examples for industry hard work, you know, that we can model our lives after. So I think Growing up in our time, we, we, we didn't really find so many of such people. We had so many people that were successful who made money, but um, they were they were they, they didn't they didn't you know exhibit that trait of greatness, which was a level of sacrifice that you extend to the society and people around you to support the communities to grow. I'll tell you where where um, you know this um, behaviors of people that embrace wrong wrong practices thrive the most. Um, there are three ways I would choose to look at it. We, 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 we have a system where our moral fabrics are you know, dysfunctional and broken. And when you have those kind of systems, uh, what usually happens is that the weakest characters and behaviors you know, will surface and you know, begin to... Every day, every day, if you go to social media, you find people you know, flashing wealth mm. or money or whatever they make. And, you know, the society doesn't really have um, a way to track, question, and bring these, you know, uh, conversations to where people can be accountable. And the other thing you also want to think about is the fact that there is, if, if, you, if you are very clear in your mind now that if you send that fraudulent email, the email can be tracked to you, you know, can be traced to you, and you can be picked and locked up for 24 years and a whole. If you are very clear in your mind that that is an option, it will minimize your propensity to do that. So we have a system where there is you know, gross impunity. People get away with all kinds of things. And uh, because of that, they are, they are encouraged to do more. You know, when, when, when bad behaviors are not punished, people's minds are more determined to push the limits of wrongdoing. Um, the other thing is also the fact that in our society, we, we applaud this behavior when someone flashes a brand new Mercedes 2020 in front of us, what we do is to applaud the person. We don't ask questions. What does he do for a living? If he's working, how much is his salary? Can he really afford that? All we do is we applaud. And the third thing is, um, you know, if, if, you, if you're wearing a nice shirt and I tell you that that shirt is good, that's a compliment. But the highest level of compliment you can give to anyone or any behavior is to imitate the person. So we find these people flaunting this um, ill-gotten, I don't want to use the word yeah. ill-gotten because we really don't know what the sources are. Mm. So they flaunt this to people around and society is applauding them. And we have a lot of young people jumping on the same bandwagon to be like them. So when you embrace what they are doing, that's the highest level of endorsement. So this is how these things uh, um, you know, continue to spread like virus. And I can tell you for free now that um, an average young person in Nigeria and Africa, I, I don't mean the, the well-intentioned ones, most people really don't see what is terribly wrong with everything we're talking about today, which is you know, to get money quick, anyhow and anyway. Okay, Pascal, um, to support, to corroborate what you have said, part of the issues I think, and I want to know what your thoughts are, uh, um, I think part of the problems are the failure of governance and in effect, how would I put it? Deficit in education. And I just don't mean just going to education you get in classrooms. I think part of the failure of education in Nigeria is that we, when it comes to character, they don't build characters in schools anymore. What, what do you think about this? So when I graduated from Unilag, my uh, certificate said that I have been found worthy in character and learning. Mm -hmm. So, but I was, I, I can't remember being taught morals and character. How do I, you know, make very hard life decisions? How do I embrace 
the best options from all the ill um, um, opportunities in front of me. I was never taught all of that. Um, if, we, if we say that our systems are broken to the point where the, the, the system has broken and they've broken us, it means that I agree with you that the system has failed, but we have fundamental individual obligations to choose how we want to model our lives. When we say that people are embracing bad behaviors and doing you know, internet scam, making money through ill-gotten means, these are just some few. So we've completely taken away the responsibility we have as individuals to choose how we want to model our lives, which is the incredible power that every human being has. As a young person growing up, I had options that I could have embraced and my life would go south. But because I knew that there were other options that I could also explore to build the kind of life that I wanted. So we shouldn't move the entire responsibility to the government. We know the government has failed, but we need to take responsibility as young people, as individuals to model our lives and build our society the way we intend it to be. Right, okay, so um, now a lot of young people, okay, it is believed that um, millennials, that is from 1981 to 1996, that they are desperate and vulnerable. So my question to you is, do you agree with that? Now, putting into consideration some of the major challenges that they have, which includes like pursuing passion in a world that is like so fast paced, and some of them have to shelter like family responsibilities, and also there is the increased cost of living and then living with parents as well, and a long list of others. So would you say that they are um, desperate and, and, and vulnerable? Yeah, I'll, I will agree with you um, on that. And, um, you know, as a young person in Africa, if we, if we were to compare apples to apples with you know, our counterparts in other parts of the world, we, we, we can call ourselves endangered species in the sense that we are, we are growing up in a very you know, fast paced time and then we you know, go to the internet and see how the world happened in different places. But the system in which we live in you know, prevents us from leveraging some of these opportunities that our friends in other parts of the world are embracing. So I agree with you that we are desperate and we are vulnerable, but at the same time, I still don't want to take out the option that we have as individuals to be able to find those very difficult options that exist, which are the ones that can actually take us to the path of freedom as individuals. So I don't want to take out that responsibility that millennials have and say that the system has failed, the government has failed. So we should also fail. We shouldn't fail with the system that has failed us. Okay, so um, we have a question from, on WhatsApp from Chisom, or is a comment, and I'd like to hear your thought on this. It says, oh. I think it's in, link, it's in line with what Lamy was trying to say. He said, good evening, but do we really need to suffer so much to survive in Nigeria and Africa? I'm just thinking, if the basics are fixed in Africa, then the focus won't be on making so much money. Yes. I mean, this is quite different in developed world. Thanks. That's from Chisom. Do you agree with uh, Chisom's comment? Because, you know, where you are, there are so many things that are working. Sometimes I feel like we should excuse some of these behavior. behavior in terms of internet fraud and all of those things. So, but I'm trying to juggle my head because somebody will say, oh, well, no, that's greed. You know, I mean, that's greed, that's this, that's that. But you see, there are some crimes where so many things have been taken off the head of that person. The child is just focused yeah. on what do I need to do to take myself to the next level? What do I need to improve on and all of that? But here, you have to suffer a lot of things. You're your own government. You have to fix a lot of problems. Like Sanzi was saying, some young people that saddled, like you at age six, man, you were saddled with providing school fees for yourself. So where do we now draw the line, you know, with, with all of this, you know, considering what Chisom is saying? Can I chip in? Yeah. Sure. And when it, I'm sorry, Pascal. When I was talking about the failure of government, mm. what I'm talking about too is corruption. Mm. Quite okay. a number of the political class still, and nothing is being done to them. And we see this so thing. And we see if it's, like it's you know, yes. So it, it induces an ordinary citizen to do it because there's no rule of law. What do you think about that? I agree. And, uh, you know, when, when you read Chisom's comments, my, my heart broke because um, it is a reality that every young person in Nigeria faces. 
there is there is just so much on your mind. You know, you let's assume that say you you, you have a full time job and um, you cannot afford to live in the main parts of Lagos and you have to live say an hour and a half drive away. You are in traffic for about an hour to an hour two hours every day of your life. You know, to and fro you do about three hours in traffic. While in traffic, you are really scared that somebody can come and knock the side of your door and probably rob you, you know, or harm you. You know, you go home, you have to deal with the fact that there might not be light and you have to deal with the noise of generator if you have if you can afford one. You know, I, I learned that during the pandemic, the government was trying to do something, but I, I was trying to imagine. I told someone that Nigeria does not have the weight to handle you know the distress of COVID-19 that the world is dealing with. And if it happens to Nigeria the way it's happening in China or Canada, the system would completely collapse. I agree that the system is failed. That's a very huge word to use on this kind of platform. There are so many things that an average young person in Nigeria is dealing with. And yes, a lot of things are not working. A lot of things are not in their favor. But the point I'm trying to make here is government has failed us. If you study nations that have really prospered, take America, for example. America wasn't built on the strength of the fact that the government was great from the beginning. If government has failed us at this stage, what do we do? Do we push the entire responsibility to government mm. and refuse to take ownership of what we can change? What you guys are doing on air is phenomenal. If we continue to have this kind of conversations in, in you know, in pockets of places, these conversations will make it to the mainstream and people will begin to hear the kind of things that they need to know. I would begin to re-engineer their minds to know that we can, in our only two ways, embrace the challenges we have and in spite of those challenges think out ideas how can we make things happen in in a nation that has failed yeah i'll stop there for now okay. i'll let you guys comment <laughs> all right all so right. Uh, okay go ahead go ahead yeah well i do want to take it to to the workplace right now because right now globally we are seeing a a a, a a panic worthy rise in, in unemployment and now most employees are calling out saying that um millennials who work who are employed that they have attitude problems and a lot of them get sacked because of that do you agree and then why is that um yeah so i'm not really an hr person to um <laughs> respond to that i don't have data to know how but many millennials all. display attitude behaviors or attitudes at work that you know okay, render right. them Outside being sacked the workplace, i don't have that the data but okay, so outside of the workplace. To... Sorry. Outside of the workplace, like when you interact with uh, fellow mil millennials, you know habits okay. and personality. Do you think we have attitude issues? No, I just think we are growing up in a different time. I don't think it's, it's an attitude issue. And the problem here is that when you when you bring in someone who is eighteen or twenty one who just finished a university and probably has a boss who is forty six or forty seven. They're living in two different times, hmm. okay? The person in the office who is 21 or 18 has a Snapchat account and an Instagram account. The one that is 46 probably does not even know what Instagram is. So the things that excite millennials today are completely different from what it is to excite most people. Hmm. And where you have this clash of opinions and ideologies, that is probably why they might interpret some of you know, our dispositions to be attitude issues. And don't forget, we live in a very fast-paced time. And there is so much that we're trying to catch up with from information that we have to process to make decisions to choices that we have to embrace and make decisions quickly. This was not the case in the time of people that lived before the millennials. So if um, that is being termed as um, attitude issue or disposition, I, I don't think that would be um, a great way yeah. to categorize it. I think if I, I would say that um, the millennials uh, that we have today, or the millennials, are actually way more passionate about Absolutely. you know making sense out of their lives. Yeah, and I think we are going to go on a break, and we're going to come back to discuss that passion because what I want us to now focus on the second half of the conversation is what we need to do. Because I loved what you said about we cannot be waiting, you know, for the government and all of that. We are very passionate. I can tell you for free, I've met a lot of passionate millennials. So how do we channel that passion and take it and take ourselves to the next level? We'll do that right after the break. Please stay with us.